Hello everyone, a very warm welcome to those of you who have joined already. Um, we are expecting quite a number of attendees from several countries still to join. So while everybody catches up, settles in, I'll just slowly walk us through some housekeeping and then I'll get on to a bit more of an introduction. Um, so in terms of housekeeping, um, you'll notice your lines are all muted. Um, cameras are turned off to minimize any technical glitches and allow everybody to focus on the screen share. So hopefully, if you're hearing me okay, you're also dialed into the right link and you can see the presentation slides okay that I'm sharing on screen. On screen, you also have a control panel. Somewhere on the left or the right, you have the ability to let us know if you're having any technical difficulties, um, but also you have a Q&A box. So throughout the presentation, at any point, if a question comes up, please submit it using the control panel. Uh, and we will have a good 10 minutes at the end to cover off any questions. So with that said, I'll um, get straight into a bit of an introduction and context setting. So as I mentioned earlier, we're expecting a high number of attendees, over a hundred different organizations from across the world. So North America, Europe, and the UK. Um, and I think you're probably joining today's call because you or your organization is being impacted by changes in global market trends. So very simply, for example, if you're dialing in from Europe and North America, over the past six months, you've seen the euro dollar exchange rate fluctuate by a huge 16% from around 110 um, to below parity around 0 0.95 not so long ago. In the UK, you're probably similarly concerned why you're seeing the pound dollar exchange rate fluctuate over the past six months by 20%. Um, and even that exchange rate not so long ago was close to parity and today it's a little bit closer to 120, a lot of volatility and movement there based on various factors. You've also probably taken those factors and those uncertainties into your discussions like you know, weekly or monthly finance meetings where you're discussing the commercial implications of some of these market trends, not just currency, but also inflation, the economy as a whole um, in terms of you know, recession fears. So if you have, you're not alone, 70% 70 70 or just close to 70% of companies we've surveyed like yours say they need more guidance on global market trends, they need more guidance on currency volatility um, to help them with currency planning and decision, maker, decision making. So that's why this today will be the first of Convera's Market Insights webinar series. Uh, it'll be coming to you every month, early in the month, um, throughout the year. These are your speakers today um, who will help provide this forward guidance that hopefully you're looking for today. Um, I'm on the left hand side, I'm Naz, I'll be your facilitator on today's call. I'll be opening and closing the call. I won't read the rest of the names along the slide here, but know that we're gonna provide a holistic global overview. So you can benefit from different perspectives from different people around the world. And that's quite useful because you, know, you may be a company dialing in today based in the US, but you may have customers in the UK or in Europe. So you can start to think about how today's topics and data and forecasts and insights not only impact you and your business, but potentially your overseas customers too. In terms of what we're gonna to cover today, the, um, the agenda is pretty straightforward. Um, we'll start off with a global overview. Um, Boris on the previous slide will cover that section. So about 10 minutes there. We'll then move over to George, who's going to cover currency trends and forecasts from a UK and European perspective. And then Joe will do a similar thing from a North American perspective. So about 10 minutes, roughly on each section. We're going to focus a lot more time today on the middle part on in terms of currency forecast scenarios to really help you visualize what these global developments mean and how could they play out in currencies over the next six months. So what slide can you take into your next uh, weekly or monthly finance meeting? In terms of just uh, just setting the scene now before I uh, hand you over to, to Boris for the main part of the presentation. So this kind of in key insights page should hopefully underline some of the challenges, some of the conversations that you've been part of in your company that's brought you on today's call. These are the kind of factors that are really hard to keep track of at the moment when it comes to forward planning um, related to currency and payments. So if you look in the top left hand corner, if you look at the US call out, you can see talk here about expectations about US interest rates have changed. They've been changing constantly over the past year. 
And this is one factor causing ripples throughout the global economy, but also rapid changes in currency markets. But if you look around the slide, I'm sure you've uh, focused in on your the region that's close to you, but there are many of the factors at play that influence global markets, such as in Europe, energy, Russia still. Well, if you look in the bottom left-hand corner, if you look at the, the UK box, you can see a lot of developments related to sterling volatility um, and still those words, recession fears. So hopefully today, this webinar is gonna help you go away more informed about market trends, upcoming events, FX volatility, and give you perhaps something to think differently about or ask yourself different questions about how you're handling and managing your currency risk or overseas payment strategies. So I'm gonna now hand you over to Boris. Boris is gonna start off today's presentation by summarizing a little bit more the global landscape, some of the key upcoming events, before we then hand over to George to dive, for, to dive more into currency analysis and forecasts. So without further delay, Boris, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Naz, for the brilliant introduction. And of course, a warm welcome to everyone joining today's webinar as well from my side. So I would like to spend the next maybe 10 to 12 minutes just briefly summarizing some of the key macroeconomic themes that are currently driving financial markets. And I think there is a clear reason why we are starting off our FX Outlook webinar with these specific macroeconomic topics in mind. Namely because, as we will hopefully see in this presentation, most of the FX volatility we have experienced over, let's say, the recent months and weeks have been largely driven by macroeconomic data, first of all, and secondly, the response of central banks to changes in these underlying data sets. And so for us, understanding this macroeconomic environment that we are currently in remains key to understanding what has and what potentially might influence the currency markets going forward. So with this all in mind, we can um, start turning to our first slide, which tries to highlight three themes that have been driving market behavior recently. We have economics, monetary policy, and geopolitics. Starting off with our first theme on the left side, um, I think we can say with quite some confidence that economic data has been in the driver's seat when it comes to FX volatility. We have We've been having falling commodity prices recently, the optimism around the avoided energy crisis in Europe, and the underway Chinese reopening. And they have all together lifted consumer and business confidence from the lows reached at the end of last year. Economic data, as I said, in general, has been beating economists' expectations in the UK, the US, and the Eurozone for the past couple of months. And this has led economists, as Nas mentioned in his preview, and central banks alike to readjust their rather pessimistic view on the economy going into the year upwards. And this positive repricing that we have seen is what is actually depicted in our second chart in the middle. Because the economy is not falling off a cliff and is in some parts of the world uh, reaccelerating, for example, in China, markets are starting to fear that central banks will, will have to raise interest rates much higher than was initially expected to cause inflation to go down to 2% again. So not only are investors now expecting these three major central banks to um, increase interest rates much higher than was initially expected, they are also not expecting these banks to cut interest rates in the next 24 months. And this is important for us because most of the volatility of the dollar against the euro and also against the pound can be attributed to these changes in, in rate hiking and cutting expectations. And less rate cut expectations from the Fed initially meant that the dollar has depreciated. And because of this dominance of inflation, of economic data over monetary policy in markets, Investors have largely ignored um, recent geopolitical developments. But what we have to note here is that most geopolitical risk indicators that we are watching are still well above pre-pandemic levels. And recent headlines around diplomatic issues between China and, and the US have been overshadowed by this positive reopening of the Chinese economy. But for us, again, the practical implications of some of the regulation coming out of the China and, and the US will start to be felt during the second half of the year, especially because of the already weakening global trade impulse that we're expecting going into the second quarter of this year. So this is something that definitely has to be watched going forward. On the next slide, we can 
continue this this monetary policy and central bank theme and start tying it into our recent FX movement that we have seen. So on this chart, we can see how the US dollar and the euro have been reacting to their respective government bond yields. Normally, Economics 101 would tell us that currencies are driven primarily by interest rates. And a higher in interest rate would mean that a currency is appreciating. But as we can see here, this is not always the case. Um, up until November, the euro's correlation with its European bond yields has actually been deeply negative. And this is because it matters what is driving interest rates higher, not that they are higher. In the US, for example, um, strong economic growth coupled with this high inflation regime has been pushing the Fed to raise its interest rates um, higher, while in the eurozone it was mostly an energy shock that has been driving monetary policy. And in this energy shock environment, the ECB rate hikes have been perceived as something negative for the economy and therefore the euro. And this is why the euro up until November has been well below parity, even though the ECB has been raising rates for the first time since 2011. And with the end of the immediate energy crisis in Europe, uh, starting in, I would say, the, the last quarter of, of last year, some of these leading in economic indicators in Europe have started recovering. And this has allowed the euro to benefit from this higher interest rate regime in Europe once again. And this, I think, explains the move of the correlation between the euro and interest rates into positive territory and something uh, a, potentially a factor why the dollar has been uh, depreciating over the last couple of months. Because of this, um, because of monetary policy and the effect of monetary policy on, on currencies um, continues to depend on the economy, risk, uh, looking at, at the risk calendar ahead um, on the next slide, I think, is probably one of the most important things to, to keep in mind for March. I won't go too much into detail here um, because there are a lot of events that will or could shape uh, FX markets in the future. But it is still important to know that all these rate decisions and all these releases of economic data are or have the potential to shape FX volatility going forward. Because we are currently experiencing these post-pandemic effects and are living through an inflation and a rate hiking regime that we have not seen since the 1980s, macroeconomic uncertainty has been unusually high. We have large revisions of first estimates of these data points, which are very common. We have a large range of forecasts, uh, which is not really something usual. And because of that, the market has really a hard time pricing in the impact of economic data beforehand meaning that most of these, this, this pricing in process has to be done after the release, resulting in these large FX movements around the release date and after it. And because of, because of this data dependent state of central banks and financial markets alike, tracking these releases is something that we are doing on a daily basis via our daily market update. It is a brief analysis on the events and, and market movers of the day before and gives a short outlook on the day ahead. It is published every morning and it is good to know that uh, you can subscribe to it via our website. So going back to the calendar, out of all these events that might or could shape FX markets in March, I think the definite highlight of the month will most likely be the interest rate decision, decision in the US um, United States, followed by the Bank of England and the European Central Bank's meeting. On my final slide, we can see the probabilities for the upcoming Fed meetings that have drastically changed over the last couple of months. And I think it is very interesting to see how much of a difference a couple of weeks makes. Just at the beginning of February, and we can see this in, in the chart below, the market has been expecting the Fed to basically end its hiking cycle in March already and to cut interest rates two times by the end of the year. Now, currently as it stands, markets see free interest rate increases of 25 basis points in March, May, and June, and they have cut all their expectations of rate, inc uh, um, rate cuts for this and the next year. What we have to say is even the possibility of a 50 basis point increase in March cannot be ruled out as it stands now, and the market is putting a, around a 30% probability of that event happening. Would the Fed decide to increase its interest rate by only 25 basis points without really showing the willingness to increase the pace 
of its interest rate increases in the future, I think the dollar could come under pressure in the short term. But again, as we said, because of the data dependent stance of the central banks, all this will depend on the incoming data that we have uh, we are expecting in the next couple of weeks and months. As important as the rate decision itself, um, the new economic and inflation projections from the central banks will be watched very carefully as well, because these will give us an insight into what the economists of these three central banks, the Bank of England, the European Central Bank and the Fed are thinking and what they are projecting or projecting over the coming quarters. It is also important to know the reaction function of central banks to incoming data. What is their priority? Are they looking at inflation more so than on economic growth? And then this is a question where, for example, China comes in. Uh, and something we can maybe answer um, later on. But again, this is something that we'll be watching in March. Um, the Fed will be in focus, but also the meetings from the European Central Bank and the Bank of England will be important in this matter. So with this information in mind, I think I can give the word to George, uh, who will start uh, showing us some bits and, and, and parts of the dynamics on financial markets going forward. Thank you, Boris, uh, for the macro summary there, insightful as always, and, and hugely important to the currency market. Of course, it's clear that this um, search for a new equilibrium or a balancing of the economy was always going to be a volatile journey, uh, and therefore, more so than ever, this macroeconomic data and, and central bank policy expectations, uh, they both continue to drive these global currency trends. So my job now is to cut through um, all of this noise of the uncertain economic and geopolitical landscape and and highlight how the currency markets uh, have evolved over the past few months and what might unfold in the future using um, scenario-based analysis, which I'll cover off towards the end of my presentation. But firstly, if we move on to the first slide, as you can see, we've had some large swings already in exchange rates this year. So this slide focuses in on, um, on, on sterling denominated currency pairs, but I should note here that our, our global monthly FX outlook report, um, it, within that we have European APAC and North American FX analysis, uh, and Joe will be covering the US piece later on. But here in the UK currency section, I've highlighted the pound versus uh, the US dollar and versus the euro, uh, as they're the most commonly traded in the UK. And as you can see, over the past 30 days, we've seen over a 4% trading range on sterling dollar uh, and over a 5% range since the start of this year, a low, around, uh, a low of around 118 uh, and a high just above 124. And we're currently trading in the lower regions uh, of these ranges. And the main reason being uh, the recent reassessment of the monetary outlook, i.e. Um, the, the Federal Reserve expected to rate, raise rates higher than what was perceived at the start of the year. And the chance of interest rate cuts by the Fed has diminished, as, as Boris highlighted a moment ago. The Bank of England, on the other hand, is expected to continue raising rates, but there are doubts emerging as to how high they're going to go and, and even a small probability of no rate hike at all this month, which is being priced in by markets. And that's weighed on the value of the pound recently. And we continue to see this downward pressure towards 120 against the US dollar, which, of course, is favorable for businesses selling pounds to buy dollars. Uh, but not so much for businesses buying dollars with pounds. So against the euro, as you can see, volatility has been uh, a bit more subdued. It isn't a, a major surprise given the similarities of UK and European economies. If we think the energy crisis uh, and the exposure to this and, and the benefits as well that both the European and UK uh, economies receive from China's reopening, but also the benefits from uh, the closer UK-EU trading relationship following the, that Northern Ireland deal that was secured last week. But ultimately, again, growth and interest rate differentials are key here. Uh, and the European Central Bank is expected to raise rates much more than the Bank of England this year. And with the deep recession fears in the Eurozone receding recently, we're starting to see more downward pressure on the sterling euro exchange rate as well. But there's little sign of a breakout at the moment in, in either direction from the, the current year to date trading range of 111 to 114. Um, some of the other ranges you can see on this table, such as uh, sterling against the South African Rand at the top there, swinging 10% already this year, just shows how unpredictable uh, and volatile exchange rates can be. And when we consider some of our own research that tells us that nearly half of our customers can only tolerate up to 10% swings before face, uh, facing financial difficulty, uh, you know, the fact that we've already seen those kind of moves already proves how challenging it is to navigate this market. And then as well, if you consider sterling dollar swung over 30% last year, you know, this really highlights how exchange rate risk is back on the agenda for companies trading internationally. 
Uh, moving on to the next slide, this is our uh, value indicator slide. Uh, and here we're showing where exchange rates are currently positioned relative to their long-term averages. So um, this allows us to identify FX purchasing opportunities uh, and also risks. So for example, if you look at the top of the table, uh, sterling against the Japanese yen leads the pack with the pound over 3% above its two-year average rate versus the yen and over 10% above its five-year average. Um, and then again, this largely is a result of monetary policy divergences. So um, the Bank of Japan sticking to its ultra easy policy stance, um, i.e. Uh, keeping interest rates at record lows in Japan, going against the grain of the aggressive rate hikes that we've seen elsewhere, um, such as in the UK, where we've seen rates rise from a record low of 0.1% of to 4% today. Um, and if you look further down the table at the bottom, sterling is trading over 1% below its year to date average against the US dollar and zooming further out over to the right hand side uh, the sterling dollar exchange rate is still seven percent below its two-year and five-year average rates um, and that rate is just shy of of 130. The main takeaway here is that there's always two sides to the story right you know there's opportunities for buyers and sellers of foreign currency so yes the pound has recovered about 15 percent from its record low of, of just under 104 last year against the dollar which is positive news for, for businesses um, that are needing to, to, to buy pounds. But the fact that sterling US dollar is still well below its long-term averages means that companies um, actually needing to buy dollars it should, should, should view this as a potential risk. Um, but there is an opportunity, you know, if you are a seller of, of, um, of dollars needing to buy pounds, then there's potential to capitalize on, on the current levels via long-term hedging strategies based on the exchange rate's current position relative to long-term averages. So moving on to what the future might hold uh, with our FX forecast scenarios. Um, and when it comes to currency forecasting, you know, there's a huge range between different forecasters. Uh, and that in itself highlights the inaccurate nature of trying to predict where exchange rates might end up over a certain time frame. So ultimately, you know, this inherent inaccuracy of these predictions makes it even more vital to be proactive about currency risk management. And it's also why we believe that this scenario-based uh, approach is more appropriate to try and safely navigate the currency markets. So the left-hand side of this chart um, shows the, the historical exchange rate of, of sterling US dollar, and the right-hand side of it shows the different paths the exchange rate could take in the future based on uh, certain economic or, or geopolitical events and trends unfolding. Uh, so in partnership with Oxford Economics, uh, a leading global economic forecaster, uh, a base case scenario and the high and low scenario generated by a, an economic model using a plethora of variables uh, and one uh, and then from that we calculate one standard deviation above and below the baseline um, to provide a more central scenario which is the gray shaded area seen on this chart um, and via our calculations that will cover about 68.2 percent of the outcomes so in layman's terms there is a, a near 70% probability of the exchange rate falling within that, that gray area, within that range. And you might be thinking this range st still seems really large, and it is, you know, a low of 116 to a high of 132 by the end of the year is just under a 15% range. But again, if you consider we've seen sterling dollar move around 16% higher in four months and a trading range of about 30% last year, uh, this suggests that neither of these um, scenarios are actually that extreme. And one additional point. I wanted to raise on, on this slide here is that the pound has actually been trading below 130 for uh, about 234 days in a row now and that's the longest sustained period be below this level that's ever been recorded uh, we, we've got to go back to 1985 which is when the currency pair last spent over 200 days uh, below 130 and, and back then when it hit 105 which was an all-time low at the time it recovered around 23 percent in four months to move back above 130 and it stayed there for 30 years. This time round, obviously, it's a lot different. We've seen a new record low of 103.80 last year, a 16% recovery in about four months to a high of 124, but the momentum to the upside has definitely uh, stalled due to those uh, repricing of, of Fed interest rate expectations. And that key 130 level seems to still be a, a way off. So this is important to, to highlight, I think, because this time last year, sterling dollar was trading well above 130. So many organizations may have agreed long-term contracts with 130 as a budget rate, but without a suitable currency hedging strategy in place, 
some of those businesses buying dollars with uh, with pounds may still be feeling the pain of the, the sharp move to the downside that we've seen in sterling dollar. But the good news is it seems as if um, that sterling dollar exchange rate is forming a decent floor around 120. Um, and, and as we've been highlighting on, on this webinar today, we do expect the dollar to eventually weaken it in 2023, meaning um, sterling dollar should climb higher, as you can see um, via that revised base case scenario trending higher on this chart. But the main takeaway is that no one really knows what the future holds. Perhaps that 120 is the new 130, and, and you know this is potentially the top of a new trading range for this currency pair. So again, to reiterate, it all depends on, on certain developments uh, evolving or unfolding. So in terms of the scenarios you see here, monetary policy divergence is, is first and foremost um, what we focus on. As Boris mentioned, the conventional wisdom is that higher interest rates in a region should result in, in a stronger currency. And when that yield advantage starts to diminish, as does the attractiveness of that currency. So this is why if the US Federal Reserve does increase rates to say 6% as some analysts are actually predicting um, and at the same time the Bank of England is forced to cut interest rates perhaps because the UK falls into a deeper recession than expected this could drag sterling dollar into the purple area shown at the bottom of the chart that downside scenario of the low teens on the flip side if the uh, the UK manages to dodge recession UK interest rates stay higher for longer whilst the Fed cuts US interest rates perhaps due to a weakening US economy sterling dollar could scale higher towards that 130 mark and another big upside risk um, that we're keeping a close eye on that could prompt such a move towards that 130 level is china's reopening uh, if indeed it does support global growth sparking demand for riskier assets and hurting the safe haven dollar if we flip over to the next slide i just wanted to provide a little bit more evidence of these certain scenarios and why we can't look at particular themes and factors driving volatility in isolation because currency dynamics are driven by multiple short and long-term factors so on the left hand side you see how the interest rate expectations for the us and uk shown here by the, the two-year yield differential has driven sterling dollar over the past year so when that spread increases meaning that us yields are rising higher than uk um, that blue line rising there, it tends to lead to a fall in sterling US dollar exchange rate, which is shown by the black line um, actually rising because the right hand axis is inverted there. So simply put, higher US rates relative to UK rates are a downside risk for sterling dollar. <clears throat> but as I mentioned a moment ago, one example of an upside risk for this currency pair is China's reopening. And the chart on the right shows that historically, when China pumps stimulus into the economy, supporting economic activity and growth, we tend to witness a depreciation of the USD, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and the, the sterling dollar exchange rate tends to rise. So will we see a repeat of this trend this time around? It's certainly a scenario to consider. You know, opposing forces are, are always in, in, in motion and it's important to take, to consider several scenarios to make sure that as a business, you're adequately positioned to take advantage of favorable moves in exchange rate, as well as being protected in the event of, of adverse currency moves. And finally, if we flip onto the, uh, my final slide, this is just an example of our sterling euro forecast scenario. Um, the same concept applies here. You know, we don't profess to know where the exchange rates are heading, but provide this scenario informed perspective uh, instead to help build that strategic insight. So could we see, upwards of 125 this year or downwards of 105 you know it depends on certain scenarios playing out some of you may have heard of uh, black swan events uh, these are uh, particular events like covid uh, and the war in ukraine which are unpredictable events with high market impact uh, you will also have though gray rhino events which in contrast to unpredictable uh, the unpredictable nature of black swan events they're more probable events with high impact meaning you know, we see that the, there's risks out there in the distance but we don't clearly perceive their full dimensions and i think as an example of, of this could be next winter um, that we've got coming if extreme cold weather and supply issues trigger gas rationing across europe higher gas prices keep inflation elevated potentially pushing europe into a deep recession you know, could this be the catalyst for sterling euro to rise into the into the 120s perhaps so again to summarize uh, we believe it's imperative to, to acknowledge extreme scenarios as well make sure your business is, is sufficiently positioned for a number of potential outcomes which could steer exchange rates in either direction uh, and and you know this is what we advocate and believe is critical for sound planning and preparedness so with that i'll hand over to joe in the us who will deep dive into the the us dollar analysis 
and its outlook. Over to you, Joe. Thanks, George. Great insight on the economic situation across the pond. And on the next slide here, while the dollar's epic surge to 20-year peaks last year has dissipated, uh, this presentation slide showing North America volatility analysis uh, illustrates how the greenback retains solid gains versus many, but not all, of its major counterparts. Here, I've isolated uh, Euro dollar and dollar Canada. Uh, those are two currency pairs uh, for this region, certainly two uh, popular currency pairs. And given that we're still in the early stages of the year, there really isn't a big difference between the 30-day range and the year-to-date range. Starting with Euro dollar, that's isolated there in the box, um, the, the first box, the higher one, uh, the high and the low over the last 30 days has been 110 to 105, while year to date shows a little bit of a wider range, uh, 110 staying at the top and uh, 104 as the low. So despite the Euro's jump in early February to 110, uh, that was the highest level in 10 months, we're still seeing the pair uh, confined toward the bottom of the range. Uh, the lower percentage position within that range, uh, it does show that Euro dollar is still favoring the bottom of the range. And basically what's behind that, uh, we've had a, a string of hot data on the US economy. Uh, as a result, we've seen market repricing in of a higher peak in US interest rates. So that has gone some way in helping uh, to strengthen the dollar because like I said last year, epic year for the greenback, 20 year highs on a trade weighted basis for the dollar, 20 year highs against the Euro. But we've seen that trend moderate and uh, the dollar actually in, in early February, we did see it fall to uh, April, uh, low, its lowest level since April of last year. And that had to do with uh, the market anticipating that maybe the Fed doesn't have much further to go in terms of raising interest rates. But then again, uh, the story changed, we've got the string of hot data. So I think what the data is really telling us is that as we emerge in this post pandemic era, if you will, we're still seeing macroeconomic data deliver these unusual patterns. And that, that's what makes everything so unpredictable. So the market got off to a slow start to the year in terms of embracing what the Fed was talking about with its forward guidance. Uh, the Fed, uh, back in December, when we last got updates, uh, economic updates from the Fed, the Fed thought that interest rates would top out somewhere around 5%. And the market was taking the under on that. The market thought that maybe the Fed might not go as high as, say, 4.9-ish percent. And on top of that, the market thought that with the economy showing signs of slowing, maybe the Fed will have to uh, cut rates uh, maybe a couple times by the end of the year. But again, the story changed. Uh, we had some hot readings on the U.S. economy, uh, job growth in January, more than a half a million jobs. Uh, we saw that um, consumer prices, they did cool to the lowest level since October of 2021 at uh, just inside of 6.5%, but that was still hotter than the market expected. And despite inflation remaining at the highest levels, the highest general levels in decades, and the Fed raising rates so aggressively, Surprisingly, we saw the consumer bounce back. We saw January retail sales up 3%, uh, the largest gain in nearly two years. So again, this uh, changed the story, and this made the market more of a believer in uh, that the Fed likely has to raise rates not only above 5%, but uh, maybe uh, closer to 5.5% uh, once all is said and done. Now, uh, for Dollar Canada, uh, the other, the lower box there at the bottom, uh, we can see pretty familiar ranges for both the last 30 days as well as year to date. And we consider the roughly uh, 2% and 3% trading range for both the past month and year to date to be fairly garden variety. Uh, in terms of uh, Dollar Canada's placement within the range, Dollar Canada is still camped towards the top of the range. Uh, you can see that's uh, the position where uh, Dollar Canada is now over the past 30 days. Uh, it's more than 80%. So again, towards the top there. Uh, while year to date, uh, it's not quite 70% uh, in terms of the, the top of the range there. Uh, and here, the higher percentage position within the range shows that the, the US dollar is keeping towards the top of that zone. So again, what's behind the, the firmer dollar? Well, central banks are certainly playing a key role. Uh, for instance, the Bank of Canada this week, we're gonna hear from the BOC tomorrow. Uh, they're expected to uh, pause rate hikes and leave their key rate at 4.5% with inflation cooling in Canada and the economy showing signs of slowing. The Fed, meanwhile, well, the Fed says uh, to expect ongoing rate increases. 
Uh, we're going to hear from the Fed chairman as soon as we get off this uh, webinar. And uh, Mr. Powell, he's going to be speaking uh, to uh, congressional lawmakers both today and tomorrow. So that's uh, one of the key focal points of the week, uh, the other one being non-farm payrolls on Friday. So we'll have to listen uh, to both uh, the Fed chair as well as the data and uh, see what that suggests about the, uh, the near-term outlook for monetary policy in the U.S. But again, the Fed is calling on uh, more interest rate hikes with inflation not coming down as quickly as officials had anticipated. And again, we cannot underscore enough that the rate outlook for both the U.S. and Canada, really universally, the same applies to uh, Europe and, and elsewhere, uh, the rate outlook is really fluid and it's subject uh, to change based on what incoming data suggest about an economy's health. So that is just one thing to mention in there. So on the next slide, we're gonna talk about uh, the FX value indicator. Here, uh, let's, what we're gonna do here is uh, basically pan out uh, and consider a wide angle view, a uh, longer term uh, rate averages, if you will. And uh, if you focus on Dollar Canada, uh, the first box here, we can see that Dollar Canada is on fairly neutral ground so far this year. Uh, but if you compare the uh, average rates over one, two, in five years, uh, that shows a firmer greenback versus Canada. Again, the Fed raising interest rates slightly more aggressively than the Bank of Canada has made a difference for Dollar Canada, which uh, last year uh, we saw Dollar Canada snap a three year losing streak and post its first annual gain since 2018. Uh, another currency, not box, but I do want to talk about is at the very bottom. Uh, like I touched on a moment ago, the dollar has outperformed many of its peers, but not all of them. And that brings to mind uh, the dollar's southern neighbor, uh, the Mexican peso. You can see here that uh, the peso, uh, the US dollar is about 3% uh, lower for the year based on its average rate. But if you look over, uh, if you look at some of the weakness for the greenback against uh, the Mexican peso over one, two, and five years, we can see weakness of anywhere from 7% to nearly 9%. And a lot of this has to do with uh, the interest rate story. Uh, we've seen aggressive rate hikes by the Fed. Uh, the Fed has raised rates by uh, 450 basis points so far. Uh, they've pledged to continue to raise rates, but that's stopping well short of what we've seen from uh, the Bank of Mexico. Uh, the Bank of Mexico, since it started raising rates in uh, June of 2021, we've seen Mexico raise rates for, at 14 consecutive meetings, and their base rate, 11%. That is a record high. So again, that is one of the factors that's caused the dollar, this, uh, this broad-based dollar strength that we've seen in general uh, over the past uh, several months, uh, that has not been applicable versus Mexico. And again, that has to do with the central bank theme uh, that has been uh, one of the key drivers of uh, market volatility. So on the next slide, we're gonna consider uh, Euro dollar future scenarios. And again, we find it more useful to focus on scenario factors as opposed to rate forecasts, which need to be updated often. So the central scenario or base case calls for the euro to grind higher in the months ahead. That's on the view that there uh, seems to be more upside for eurozone interest rates than US lending rates. On the one hand, the Fed is tentatively seen raising rates by another 75 basis points, uh, 25 this month, and then uh, another 25 basis points at the, the next two meetings after uh, this month. On the other hand, the ECB might have to do uh, twice that. We might have to see the ECB raise rates by uh, 150 basis points uh, as we go through the course of this year uh, to around 4% uh, compared to 2.5% uh, so where their key rate is currently. So uh, for Euro upside potential, could we test 115 or maybe even higher? Well, that might be uh, if we were to see the, the Europe's economy fare better than expected and avoid a deep downturn, uh, that would certainly be Euro positive. Uh, so that's one thing, that's one scenario to consider if uh, the resilience that we've seen in the European economy, if that gains traction, uh, that could certainly be positive for the Euro and allow it to extend its rebound from the 20 year lows uh, we saw back in uh, last September. To the downside, could we see the Euro fall back towards 103 or maybe even lower? Well, if the European economy should fare worse than expected, uh, that's one thing to consider. The winter is not quite over. Certainly it'll be spring in a few weeks, but should temperatures take a dive, uh, maybe that could raise new questions about energy supplies. And that has been a key theme of uh, Euro negativity. So that's just one thing to keep in the back of your mind. 
Also, uh, the euro would tend to be vulnerable to the downside if the Fed ends up having to raise rates more than what the markets are currently anticipating. So on uh, the next and final slide for me, I'm gonna talk about Dollar Canada future scenarios. So here, the, the central scenario sees Dollar Canada largely sticking to the range that we've seen, call it uh, 132 to 136, given that uh, US Canada interest rate trajectories are not dramatically different. Canada, Wednesday, tomorrow that is, is expected to pause uh, rate hikes and maybe not, but but uh, maybe not for long given the nation's uh, job market. If we continue to see a strong and resilient Canadian job market, maybe that puts uh, new pressure, new upward pressure on inflation. So uh, that's one thing to consider. Uh, to, for, for Dollar Canada upside, could we see Dollar Canada break above its current range, maybe test 140 or higher? Well, a potential catalyst to strengthen the US dollar would be if Canada's economy should slow more than anticipated. On the other hand, uh, to the downside, could we see some uh, Dollar Canada uh, downside in terms of levels of 130, maybe even lower? Well, that could materialize if, Canada's, uh, if Canada has to resort to uh, raising interest rates again, or if the US economy falters under the weight of these ongoing rate increases by the Fed to attack inflation. So those are just some of the things to keep in mind. If those scenarios were to come to fruition, uh, that could be negative for the US dollar versus its Canadian counterpart. So that's, uh, that's, that's the situation here in North America. I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Naz, uh, turn it back over to Naz for the international strategy. Thank you, Joe, um, George and Boris. Um, and thank you for everybody for uh, continuing with us on the call. We've still got a, a good 10 to 15 minutes left to go. I'm gonna share with you some um, strategic considerations that you may wanna think about going forward. Um, so just allow me a few minutes to do that. We won't spend too long on this section. Um, we then move on to Q&A. Um, so please, if you have a question about any of the content covered or a question about any content that's not been covered today, use your control panel, submit your questions, and hopefully we'll have a good five to 10 minutes at the end for Q&A and then hopefully get you off um, before the hour um, at the end of the call. So with that, I'll move you on to just some practical um, considerations and next steps to consider um, and maybe give you some idea of the type of conversations we're currently having with over 30,000 customers across different types of industries, verticals, import or export of goods and services. So rather than trying to read through this, if you stay with me on the far left hand side in the box focused on currency volatility, and you can see there, if I just read off the, the statement, what if we continue to see material five to 10 percent shifts in your key exchange rates? We've talked about some of that today. Um, who in your organization is responsible for tracking and reporting these kinds of shifts? You know, what do they mean in terms of are they positive for your organization, a risk for your organization? Who does something about it? What products or solutions do you use um, to make changes in your business strategy? So if these are some of the things that are on your mind, you may want to talk to us about risk management and may want to follow up with us in terms of speaking to our hedging solutions to help show you how other organizations deal with the same problems that you face today and you may continue to face over the next 12 months. In the middle, you know, Boris earlier talked a lot about geopolitics. We haven't touched on sanctions related to Russia today. It's a subject that we may wanna come back to in a future webinar, but generally speaking in the middle there, if you look at those two sections, if you're dealing with complexities related to import and export trade, maybe you're picking up and moving supply chains or diversifying supply chains. Every time you make those decisions, someone else in the organization has to also do the same thing in terms of diversifying your financial supply chain. What currency are you sending to which country using what method? If you need help with that, those are some of the conversations we can have. And finally, there's climate change, there's the climate change, there's lots of other considerations. You may want to talk to us uh, about mass payments or multiple currency payments around the world. So last comment is, you know, ask yourself, are you using the most, most effective technology and payment method to do this? How, how are you saving time and cost? So we're serving lots of large global financial institutions, payroll organizations, universities. So come and ask us, talk to us about what financial technology and automation solutions we're providing them 
to help them do things quicker, faster and easier today. So those are just some thoughts I wanted to leave you with. Um, and let's take you now into the Q&A section. Um, and we're doing well on time, so we've still got plenty of, of minutes to cover as many as questions as you have. And once we get through those questions, I'll close off with a couple of comments such as, how do you get access to today's slides? How do you get access to the recording? So as a reminder, um, <clears throat> I'll just slow down here, here a little bit, give you a few minutes to, uh, to think about any questions that you have. Like I said, submit them using your control panel. Um, and I'll start going into those um, as they come in. There is one that's coming early. Um, and Boris, I think you touched on China a little bit earlier. So I'm going to pass this one to you which is, is the Chinese economy reopening more of a growth issue or an inflation issue? Um, and could it actually lead to more rate hikes around the world? Yeah, thanks, Naz. Brilliant question. Um, I think we we think of China more as a positive growth impact for the global economy than necessarily being an inflationary event. Um, and I would say there are several reasons why we are more prone to be optimistic on China than, than several other um, economists. I would say, first of all, the Chinese uh, consumer confidence is still sitting near record lows, which means that uh, sometimes we'll have to pass for the Chinese household to be able and, and confident enough to spend some of the excess savings that have occurred over the last three years. Um, it, this will not be a sudden process like it was with the reopening of the US and Europe. Um, this will be more gradual, especially because of all the uncertainties that the world economy is currently facing. The second part is also that the environment that China is reopening in is completely different than one and a half years ago. When the US and most of the part of the, of the world reopened, it was a synchronized reopening of these excess savings that are, uh, were being spent within the economy. Now we have a slowdown in most parts of the world, especially the Eurozone and the US. Um, and some economists are expecting the Eurozone to fall into recession in the second quarter of this year. Um, and so China is really an outlier in terms of being a strong uh, growth, growth impulse for the economy. So because of this, um, even though the Chinese impulse will in our opinion, be positive for the world economy. Because it is not synchronized with all the other regions, it won't have an inflationary effect, especially not uh, as such a strong inflationary impact uh, like it had with the reopening of the US and the Eurozone. But again, China is probably the most important topic that we didn't uh, particularly go too, too deep into in this webinar, because I feel like this is something for the webinar in April, um, because we have to say that China, just looking at the correlations between China and these Chinese um, reopening indices and the Chinese PMIs and so on, the correlation between them and the euro dollar or the, the trade weighted US dollar index are really uh, astonishing. So if we are expecting China to reopen and bring this momentum into the world economy, this is definitely an environment where the US dollar would not perform. Right, And because George and, and Joe said that it's all about scenarios, we have to consider what happens if the reopening is stronger than expected and what would happen if the reopening is, is, is weaker than expected. Um, and this would definitely shape EURUSD uh, going forward. Thank you, Boris. Um, I'll move on to another question um, more relevant for UK, Europe. Um, so George, I think maybe I'll send this one your way. Why, why didn't the UK EU deal on Northern Ireland support the pound's value more? Uh, cheers, Naz. Um, thanks for the question. An interesting one. I think there was a fair bit of hype as usual when it comes to uh, Brexit-related news and updates like this one. Um, and, and last week, at the, at the start of last week, when that deal was secured. There was actually a short-term boost for the pound. Um, but I think there's several reasons why it wasn't sustained. Um, I mean, one, yes, that that deal does alleviate some of those uh, major trade frictions um, between uh, the UK and EU, but it's unlikely to make any material difference to the wider economic outlook uh, for the UK. Northern Ireland only contributes less than 2% of economic output in the UK. So that's one potential reason. Um, a second reason, Brexit fatigue, simply put, um, you know, Sterling seems less sensitive to Brexit news these days um, because one thing that we're looking at closely is, is the, the Bank of England's Brexit Uncertainty Index, 
which the pound uh, had a negative correlation with um, over the past few years. So when that uncertainty um, increased, the pound's value uh, declined. But um, that correlation seems to have uh, decoupled um, since since late last year. And there's there's other factors that are driving currencies instead. And at the same time, uh, a Bank of England survey recently showed that compared to back in 2019, where half of, uh, of firms in the UK saw Brexit as a top three source of uncertainty, that's now just one in six firms. So you know, the reality seems to be that the Brexit isn't uh, it is no longer a key source of uncertainty amongst businesses. And then just to reiterate, I think the fact that the, the global currency markets are really being driven uh, and the pound primarily being being driven by global risk environment and the interest rate differentials, they're the important drivers of FX volatility right now. Hey, thank you, George. Um, another question come in related to cryptocurrency uh, and could this remove FX? Um, and what I think I'll do is take this question in terms of not ignoring it, but actually recognizing that it's a very important question. Um, it's a big question which requires a big answer. Uh, and we are hoping to, to set up additional webinars in the future where today we talked about market trends, economic developments, how they're affecting currency volatility and risk. Um, and in the future, we should also be hosting webinars, but more focused on payment trends and technology shifts. So think about SWIFT GPI, think about ISO 200 2022, um, talk about the shift towards central bank digital currencies. So coming back to crypto and blockchain, is it going to threaten FX or is it actually putting pressure on the international payments industry and currency markets to evolve a lot quicker than what they thought they needed to? Um, so more to come on that one, um, and keep, please keep those questions coming. Um, one of the questions that's come in, Joe, I think I'm going to send this your way. Uh, we've got a lot of people on the call uh, from around the world, uh, not just the US, who are worried about the value of the dollar. A lot of it's been driven by US interest rates. So question here is, how high could the Federal Reserve raise interest rates? Is there more to come here? Well, that's a good question. And actually, that's one uh, question that the Fed is going to offer its best uh, estimate, its best guess at answering that for us when the Fed meets later on this month. Uh, on March 22nd, that's going to be the next meeting of the Fed. And this is one of those quarterly meetings for the U.S. Central Bank where we not only get a rate decision, but we also get new economic projections where the Fed see how the Fed sees the economy growing this year, where it sees interest rates ending the year. So that's going to be really important. But as we touched on, you know, hot data has the Fed on track, at least right now, to raise rates to about 5.5% from about 4.6% uh, where they are now, roughly. Um, back in December, the Fed did estimate, it gave us a range of uh, how high it could raise rates for this year. And uh, back in December, it said anywhere from 5.1% up to 5.4%. So we're toward the top end of that estimation. But uh, the thing to look out for here, everything hinges on inflation. So if inflation continues to cool in the U.S., but if it's not cooling uh, to central bankers' satisfaction, then maybe a so-called terminal rate, uh, that's what they call the, uh, the peak in U.S. interest rates or any interest rates, the terminal rates might have to be closer to 6%. Uh, so something like that might not be out of the question. A higher level uh, in the vicinity of 6% might not be out of the question. Brilliant. Thanks, Joe. So last couple of minutes um no more and then i'll move on to like i mentioned earlier how to get the slides um, we've got a couple of comments here about how to get access to the slides and the recording so we will get to that in just a couple of minutes um one last question here i think um for boris if you don't mind covering this boris um question that's coming will supply chains ever get back to pre-pandemic levels um and what are the ongoing fx impacts yeah, good question. Thanks, Nas. Um, I would say it depends on how we're defining supply chains. Um, there are multiple indicators, for example, freight uh, costs or shipping costs from China to North America and Europe that are already uh, touched uh, to pre-pandemic levels last week, which is a positive sign and should be deflationary um, for this and the next year. But there are some issues that um, won't see pre-pandemic levels um, just because of structural changes. Um, some of the things are, for example, the nationalization of supply chains. There are multiple programs, not only from the US and the European 
governments, but also from Japan and South Korea, and lately also from China, that are trying to strengthen or even to nationalize uh, certain parts of the supply chain. So this is something we have talked about in many previous webinars in that is uh, one development that is definitely to be watched in, in the next couple of months. But again, as I said, in terms of price pressures, in terms of the supply chain bottlenecks, they have all uh, or mostly all um, already returned to pre-pandemic levels, which is a good sign uh, for the economy. The problem with this is that it is a good sign because, as I said, it acts as a deflationary force going, going ahead. But one problem is that most of these easings of supply chains actually come from weaker global demand. If we look, for example, at global trade, uh, global trade has been negative for the past uh, three months, uh, uh, consecutive three months. And if we look at leading indicators, uh, for example, we had yesterday export and import data from China, which was more negative than expected. If we look at leading indicators like um, trade from South Korea, which was also highly negative. So this is something uh, that has a positive uh, and, and a negative side effect. Supply chains, by and large, have um, started going back to pre-pandemic levels. But um, the reason for, for it is that we have seen weaker demand over the last couple of months. Boris, thank you very much for that. So um, with that, um, I'm going to respect the time and um, try and give everybody a couple of minutes back. So if you don't mind to just allow me one more minute for some closing remarks um, on this last slide. So firstly, thank you. Um, the recording of this call will be available for you within 24 hours. Um, so it, once you registered for today's webinar, you'll automatically receive the recording um, via the same email address of currency combo at Compera. So look out for that email from that email address. Um, if you um, are still requiring slides um, from today's presentation, you can use the contact details that I'm going to put up here in a second. Um, uh, but also reach out to your account manager and account executive at Convera. So just final closing remarks. Thank you very much for today's presenters, but thank you for joining. We've had over 140 attendees from around the world. And the ultimate objective is that, you know, we hope that this webinar today will help you go away a little bit more informed about economic trends, upcoming events, but most importantly, how this may impact FX volatility um, you may want to consider using some of the slides today, like the forecast scenario slide, um, to maybe think a little bit more differently or ask yourself different questions about how are you managing currency risks, um, how are you managing your overseas payment strategy. This will be the first of a monthly series. Uh, we look forward to seeing you on the next one. And with that said, wishing you all the best. Good luck. <laughs>